we cannot read far into the Gospels before we come across a parable. Some are so well known that they've entered our everyday language. Who has not heard of a good Samaritan, for example? Although those that do not read the Bible may get a surprise when they actually meet him in Luke's Gospel. Most recognise parable as a Bible word, although they are found in many other places. And the best teller of parables is undoubtedly Jesus. Three well-known examples from Luke chapter 15 all deal with something that got lost. A sheep, a coin and a son. The son who got himself lost, sometimes called a prodigal, which is not a word many of us use in daily conversation. Ambrose Bierce cynically defined it as someone who used to go to the dogs, but who now is believed to go straight to the devil. Well, perhaps. Anyway, Jesus told these three stories for one reason. He was answering the grumbles of those holier-than-anyone Pharisees and experts in the Jewish faith who thought and said that Jesus should not be spending his time with sinners and social outcasts, to which Jesus responded with three stories that all make the same point. God loves sinners and is happy when they see sense and turn to him, so happy that he throws a party to celebrate. Parables always have a point. Otherwise, there's no point in telling them. Sometimes the point is clear and obvious. Sometimes the listeners needed a hint before they got it, as in the story of the sower. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 15. This is from Eugene Peterson's interpretive translation called The Message. As they went from town to town, a lot of people joined in and travelled along. Jesus addressed them using this story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Some of it fell on the road. It was tramped down and the birds ate it. Other seed fell in the gravel. It sprouted but withered because it didn't have good roots. Other seed fell in the weeds. The weeds grew with it and strangled it. Other seed fell in rich earth and produced a bumper crop. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Which sounds straightforward enough to me, but then I've heard it before and the disciples had not. So they ask for an explanation. Back to Luke 8. His disciples asked, why did you tell this story? He said, You've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. There are others who need stories, but even with stories, some of them aren't going to get it. Their eyes are open, but don't see a thing. Their ears are open, but don't hear a thing. This story is about some of those people. The seed is the word of God. The seeds on the road are those who hear the word but no sooner do they hear it than the devil snatches it from them so they won't believe and be saved. The seeds in the gravel are those who hear with enthusiasm, but the enthusiasm doesn't go very deep. It's only another fad, and the moment there's trouble, it's gone. And the seed that fell in the weeds, well, these are the ones who hear but then the seed is crowded out and nothing comes of it as they go about their lives worrying about tomorrow, making money and having fun. But the seed in the good earth, these are the good hearts who seize the word and hold no matter what, sticking with it until there's a harvest. Obvious once it's explained to us, but sometimes we're not given the key to unlock the meaning which can lead to confusion and may mean we never hear the story. Preachers and teachers steer clear. I know I do. So here is an example from Luke 16. I will read it in the British English edition of the English Standard Version, which I generally find to be clear and accurate. He also said to the disciples, 
there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions and he called him and said to him what is this that i hear about you turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager and the manager said to himself what shall i do since my master is taking the management away from me i'm not strong enough to dig and i'm ashamed to beg i have decided what to do so that when i am removed from management people may receive me into their houses so summoning his master's debtors one by one he said to the first how much do you owe my master he said a hundred measures of oil he said to him take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty and he said to another and how much do you owe he said a hundred measures of wheat he said to him take your bill and write eighty the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light and i tell you make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails they may receive you into the eternal dwellings one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much if then you have not been faithful with the unrighteous wealth who will entrust to you the true riches and if you have not been faithful with that which is another's who will give you that which is your own no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and money i am confident that this story is not as well known to most as the good samaritan or the lost sheep although the punchline is well known you cannot serve both god and money the final word in the esv is money which is a translation of the greek word mammonas mammon mammon can mean wealth or riches and so money is an acceptable translation but it was also used as a personification like minerva was the personification of wisdom or eris was the personification of strife so in the new testament times mammon became the god of wealth and we cannot serve two gods that was a wise teaching when jesus said it and it remains the case for us today but there is some background that might make the story clearer just as it helps to know that for jewish listeners in the first century the samaritans were considered to be beyond the pale unclean scum so a samaritan stopping to help an injured jew was unexpected unheard of but in that story it was a samaritan that did the right thing and we need to do the same Back in the first century, most Jews generally kept most of the law given to them by God through Moses. But of course, there were always some that looked for loopholes. The law forbade the lending of money at interest between fellow Jews. So some got round it by lending other things such as oil or grain. It could be that what the manager, steward in some older translations, the manager was deducting from the bill the amount of interest the rich owner had been charging. As was typical at the time, the rate on oil was higher than that on grain. This is olive oil for lamps, and the grain was probably barley for bread, but these details are unimportant. So by reducing the amount owed by the borrower to the amount they had been lent minus the interest charged, the borrowers were delighted and the rich man could do not do anything about it. Was he to take his steward, soon to be ex-steward, to court to accuse him of 
not charging interest and so in effect not breaking the law. He would be laughed out of court. So the shrewd manager had made some friends who would be likely to do him a favour in return and the rich man was a little bit less rich than he had been and I hope had learned a lesson. But what is the lesson that we are to take from this story? It is a parable, remember, a story with a point and not a business guide on how to make your first million. Any parable told by Jesus involving a master and a steward would be understood to mean just one thing by the original listeners. The master was God and the steward or servant was Israel. Way, way back, many centuries ago, God placed Israel in charge of the land he had promised them. They were to be good stewards and to ensure that there was sufficient for everyone. Much of the law was designed to make Israel a fair and just society. Every 49 years, debts were to be cancelled and slaves set free. Mortgaged property was to be returned to the original owners, the year of jubilee. So far as we can tell, it was not observed as often as it should have been, but that was what God had intended. Sadly, Israel had failed to follow the divine plan. The Pharisees and their followers wanted, to their credit, to do something about this, but they went about it the wrong way. Their default position was to make the law stricter, with the unintended consequence of making it even harder for ordinary people to keep the law in full. So I believe in this story, Jesus is urging his fellow Jews to abandon the way of the Pharisees, the way of the ultra-Orthodox fundamentalist, and instead to make friends wherever they could. So to look beyond Israel to the world at large, the world of the Romans and the Samaritans and all the rest of them, all the rest of us. Because while we are indeed God's people, not all of us have the honour of being descended from Father Abraham. I do not believe we should understand this parable literally. We do not live in a world where we barter oil and grain to pay our debts. But this story might possibly, perhaps, be telling us something important. We, God's people, here and now, must understand what is important and what is opinion. We can sum up the gospel in many ways. For me, the crucial verses are in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Add Peter's answer to the question he was asked in Acts 2, what must we do to be saved? Peter replied, repent and be immersed, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what should we conclude from all this? Not attempting to serve God and money is clear and obvious. But sadly, the church needs to be reminded of this all too often. If we are blessed with much, then much is expected of us. We need to be blessing others, just as God has blessed us. It is only when we put God first in everything that our wealth will be in its right place. Put God first. As for the story of the shrewd manager, I think so. This is my opinion and you can draw your own conclusion if you do not think this one fits. I think the story is telling God's people to use their brains. Worldly people, like the crooked manager, 
can sometimes see what needs doing more clearly than God's people, and they get on and get it done. I expect we have all met people, good people, godly people, who are so heavenly minded that they are of little earthly use. The challenge of living in a fallen world without being compromised by it is not easy. It is, as I said, a challenge. And we have to use all the faculties God has given us to serve him. May God bless us as we seek to put him first in our lives. Amen.